the cycling podcast in association with Rafa. From grand tours to group rides, the Champs-Élysées to coffee shops, Rafa exists to celebrate the world's most beautiful sport. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Daniel Freib. Hello, Rich. And Lionel Burney. Hello, Rich. Hello, fellas. Uh, we are convening a day after Paris Roubaix, um, and it's not the first time we've had this terrible experience of of, of having a somber tone to things because uh, Paris Roubaix was marked, unfortunately, by a terrible tragedy: the death of 23-year-old Michael Golart. So. Belgian rider with Willems Verandas, he suffered a heart attack and it wasn't initially clear whether uh, the heart attack caused him to, to crash or whether he crashed and then suffered a heart attack. But it seems today, Monday, not 24 hours after the, the awful incident, that uh, it was in fact a heart attack that caused the crash. The spokesman for the regional court has said today Monday that according to our initial information some form of medical issue without doubt cardiac related caused the crash rather than a crash causing his medical state. He was taken by air ambulance to hospital in Lille and pronounced dead quite late on Sunday night so very very sad indeed and um, and it, and it casts a, a shadow over what was a, a brilliant race which we will discuss in full very soon but a, a very a very sad ending to what had been a great day well you, you're absolutely right rich um a, a tragic ending to the day and, and what's especially jarring is you know when you go back and look at social media and and you look at uh, michael golart's posts on things like twitter and you realize that um well everything was was normal as far as he was concerned as far as his you know family were concerned his team were concerned he was very much looking forward to the race of a lifetime and then um yeah off he goes to race and and doesn't come back which is um yeah an uh, uh, an awful tragedy for for all concerned really and you know this is not unfortunately the first time um this has happened in professional cycling that riders have died in mid race we've had riders die in their sleep it's been a a terrible sort of 10 years or so for, for Belgian cycling um, in this respect. There have been um, a number of cases of, uh, well, there was a, uh, an athlete, Frederick Nolf, another young Belgian who died in his sleep in one of the golf races in 2009. And um, then we, even two years ago, there was a Belgian rider, Dan Mingier, who died, collapsed uh, mid-race in the Criterium International. Uh, and then we've had cases like the Stig Broeks, uh, Lotto Sudal rider who had a terrible accident and um, is still recovering and, and Frank Vandenbroeke and, and, and so forth and so forth um, it, it, it's it, it's an issue the issue of sudden cardiac deaths um, is something that all professional sports pretty much have, have had to deal with um, for a long time and, and cycling has been pretty proactive about this and the protocol in place it is a fairly it looks to be a fairly rigorous one um, every athlete in a pro continental division team or a, a world tour team has to undergo uh, uh, an electrocardiogram every year and and every two years they have to undergo a more rigorous series of electrocardiograms um, but unfortunately the sort of medical literature on this particular issue um, is pretty unanimous in in agreeing that that they those tests will only pick up so many sort of um, issues and, and so many problems that that could unfortunately lead to terrible tragedies like this one. Yeah, it's a very different set of circumstances to a couple of years ago when Antoine de Moitier died during um, the Gent Wethergem race. He was he was struck by a motorcycle that was uh, working within the race and so um, obviously on that occasion you know we, we talked about the way that races are secured um, for the safety of of the whole peloton and, and in this case um, you know, at the moment the, we don't know the circumstances surrounding uh, Michael Goulart's um, death. So, really, all we can do at the at the, at the moment is, uh, you know, offer our condolences to uh, his family and friends and and the team. 
Absolutely. Um, you, you make a, a very interesting point, Daniel, about, about social media. And, th- you know, he's not a writer, Michael Golarts, with whom we were, we were very familiar. Um, of course, he, you know, he wasn't writing at world tour level, he's writing for a slightly smaller team. But, you know, looking at his Twitter account uh, and the, the, the pictures he posted, it, it makes it all the more poignant because you can see, uh, you know, a, a life just ended in, while well, he was in his prime. His last post was actually a, a, fo- a photograph from the Tour of Flanders. Um, he was in the break at the Tour of Flanders and he actually had made a very good start to the season, some really good results. So it just adds, it adds, uh, you know, even more poignancy to what is an awful tragedy. Um, and as Lionel says, we all send our condolences, of course, to his his family and friends and to the team. Um, we will in a moment reflect on what was a, a great race that carried on and was won by Peter Sagan, uh, the world champion. Uh Lionel, you can give us your weekly news roundup, please, so that we can catch up with everything that's gone on in in the world of cycling. Uh, I will, Rich. Yeah, well, Peter Sagan won the second monument of his career, uh, became the first reigning world champion to win Paris-Roubaix since Bernardino in 1981. Uh, he rode away from the group of favourites with 54 kilometres to go, and uh, the only man from the early break who was able to stay with Sagan uh, to the finish was Sylvain Dillier of AG2R. Uh, Dillier broke his finger at Strada Bianca last month and only returned to action um, 10 days or so ago, winning the route Adelie, so uh, clearly was in good form and, and was obviously in great form, um, not only hanging on to Sagan's uh, coattails, but um, doing some work in the f- uh, closing 20 or 30 kilometres. Um, Dillier led into the velodrome, led out the sprint, uh, but Sagan came past with ease. Um, so, we're, yeah, we will talk about the, the way the race unfolded. Uh, Nicky Terpstra uh, clipped away from the chasing group just to take third place on the podium and a bit of a consolation prize for quick step, but we'll assess their tactics as well in the first part of the podcast. Uh, other racing, a lot of other racing going on. The Tour of the Basque Country, or Itzulia, as it's been rebranded, is won by Primoz Roglic of Lotto NL Jumbo and Richard actually pointed out that Roglic was the only Lotto NL Jumbo rider to finish the race so um, quite uh, extraordinary that he uh, yeah the only one to, to make it all the way to the finish I think, it was I, think he had some, I think he had some teammates who started the race but I didn't actually see them during the race at all that sounds very no, unkind but w- well I mean it was yeah, a very I mean, much a lone a lone victory I think and it was set up with a time trial victory as well. He won the time trial stage, and, and uh, but then climbed very well. And um, Mikel Lander was second overall, but over a minute down on Roglic. There were stage wins for Jay McCarthy, Omar Friley, and Enric Mass uh, towards the end of the week. Of course, Julian Alaphilippe had won the opening couple of stages for Quick Step. Uh, sticking with the Basque Country, there was a Movistar 1-2 at the Clásica Primavera. Uh, where Andre Amador and Alejandro Valverde finished just ahead of the next group and Amador took the win. In France at the Circuit de la Sarthe, it was won by Guillaume Martin, who will be leading Wanty Group Gobert at the Tour de France later on this year. Uh, Dan McClay, the British sprinter, won his first race for Team EF Education First. And uh, the Commonwealth Games, the track programme has been completed. Um, I know, Richard, you've been glued to the Commonwealth Games, haven't you? Haven't we all? the outstanding stories well the Aussies um, dominated as perhaps you would expect uh, 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 their home games on the Gold Coast um, Do- dominated is a big word dominated is a big word well well, okay they won the most gold medals okay um, <laughs> new world record in the men's team pursuit 3 minutes 49.804 um, as the Aussies took gold in the men's team pursuit they also won the women's team pursuit they dominated the sprinting certainly Matthew Glatzer won two golds one in the Kirin one in the kilometre Stephanie Morton won the sprint and Kirin Carly McCulloch won the 500 metres and the two of them paired up to win the team sprint the British success came mainly in the endurance events there was a gold for Katie Archibald of Scotland in the individual pursuit and for Eleanor Barker of Wales uh, in the points race, and for Charlie Tanfield of England in the individual pursuit. And uh, Neil Fackey, Fackey? Neil Fackey of Scotland and Sophie Thornhill of England, well, they won two of the para-track events each. Uh, uh, Daniel, are you still there? Have you... Um, just about, yeah. <laughs> Mark, I mean... Commonwealth, Commonwealth indoor what? cycling is... Um, 
<laughs> nah, not really. Not really my. Not not your bag. Not colo- your bag. Not my not my cup of colonial tea. Shall we say? Um, <laughs> Mark Stewart. I, before we move on, I have to say Mark Stewart's uh, win in the points race was outstanding uh, and continues a, a very good start to the year for Scottish cyclists. What with Ali Hodge of Quick Step winning a stage in Catalonia as well recently. Those two events are not connected, though, are they? No. And lastly, Rich, uh, Amy Peters led a uh, Bowles Dolman's dominance of the Healthy Ageing Tour. Bowles Dolman's took the first four places overall. Uh, Amy Peters, who's been in great form lately, won overall ahead of Chantal Black. Christine Majerus was third and Anna van der Bregen was fourth. The first non bowles Dolman's rider was Kirsten Vilt, who's in fifth place overall. Um, they also did very well on the stage wins front because van der Bregen, Peters... And Black all won stages. Bowles Dolmans also won the team time trial, so a very good week for them. A community around the world. Stories and films with the most compelling characters. The world's finest apparel. Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Thank you very much to our main sponsor, Rafa. Very grateful, as always, to them for their support of the cycling podcast. And some new product news from Rafa this week. They've just launched their men's and women's Pro Team Aero products with cutting edge fabrics to make you faster and an improved fit for comfort. Head to the online store, that's at rafa.cc, to see them demonstrated by two time track world champion Andy Tennant and Alice Barnes of Canyon Shram Racing. Alice Barnes has been riding very well, actually. She was second in a stage of the Healthy Aging Tour last week. Or if you want to pick up the new clothing and try it on, head over to one of Rafa's many clubhouses throughout the world to take a closer look. So I don't want to return at this early point in the podcast to our predictions for Pirate Bay last week because they were spectacularly wrong, weren't they? Well, as generally tend I to be. tipped Jasper Stuyven and he was fifth. He was in that chase group. That was a decent result. Mm-hmm. I tipped uh, Peter Sagan's teammate. Daniel Loss. Mm-hmm. So actually, actually, we did pretty well. I can't. Who did you tip again, Dan? Oh, Arnold Demar. He he had a difficult Demar, day, didn't he? Yeah, had a shocker. Had an absolute mm-hmm. shocker. Yeah. Um, Peter Sagan though did well. He delivered what he has promised to deliver. Uh, you know, he he was the bookies' favourite. Daniel was very dismissive of that, but he, it's just a kind of given that he starts every race pretty much as favourite. And you know, his problem has been winning, um, and. I mean, he he to use a a horrible phrase. He answered his critics, didn't he? On on Sunday, it was a, a barnstorming performance, and a really clever ride because he, you know, it was interesting. Just the the parallels with the Tour of Flanders the previous week, when Nicky Terpstra attacked from a similar distance, uh, bridged up to a break of three, as did Sagan. Uh, Terpstra went straight past them. Sagan used Dillier well he he used the break as much as he could and Dillier was the last man to survive and I thought he was very clever I I wasn't sure whether they talked to each other quite a lot perhaps a deal was done the deal being nothing illicit um but but simply you know if if you help me I'll you you I'll take you to the velodrome and and you you know you you finish second um well, I think that the deal, Rich, was that Sagan was going to pull on the cobbles and Dillier was going to mm. do some pulling on the asphalt sections. Yeah, and and that 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 there's nothing wrong with that. Cy- cycling is all about deal making, isn't it? And it was a, an arrangement that benefited both of them. Um, Dillier was able to hang on for for second. Uh, Sagan took a, a really brilliant win, and and uh, I think we saw. You know, he he can be he can. He can say Sagan that he's all about entertaining and victories don't mean much to him, but I think we saw when he crossed the line what that meant to him. Yeah, I think you, know, you mentioned the timing of the attack, Rich, and we've talked quite a lot in this classic season about this issue and this theme of, of you know, placing winning attacks at slightly different moments from what one or what the uh, the other riders might be expecting. And that happened with Nibali on the podio. It was slightly earlier than people were expecting. And then with Terpstra last week in Flanders. And I think um, Sagan's attack came at a time of the race where I think Greg Van Avermaet had just tried to attack and Stiba had been off the front um, a little bit earlier. And there was a bit of a lull in proceedings. And... I think the, the nature of Sagan's attack was, well, it wasn't the most spectacular sort of barnstorming stomp on the pedals kind of attack. He sort of um, just slid off the front. And, and I think that maybe duped 
the the following group slightly and, and they didn't quite take it seriously enough um, as, as soon as they should have and um, you know, we we talked at uh, Milan San Remo about how everything happens there almost on fast forward and there is no mistakes. Um, I think in Flanders you get more time and in Paris-Roubaix usually you get even more time to correct your mistakes. You know, the, even when Sagan was 40 seconds or 50 seconds ahead at that point, if the, the chase had been well organised, they could uh, conceivably have caught him. But um, I thought they, they let the gap go to 40, 50 seconds far too easily. Um, and, um, and you know, Quick Step were, was sort of not at sixes and sevens, but they'd had various um, contretemps, as you do in Paris-Roubaix. You know, Yves Lampert had been out the back with uh, mechanical issues. And then um, Gilbert and Stebard had both really made the wrong decision in the timing of their attacks. Gilbert had, had gone off the Arenberg Forest and, and Stebard gone with about 60 kilometers to go. And they just weren't, I, I felt that they weren't well organized at that point with about 55 kilometers to go and they weren't really in a position to organize a proper chase. Yeah, I thought the, the two big crashes were really important when, you know, reviewing how the race actually shook out. The the first big crash was on the first section of cobbles, Troisville. Um, you know, the, the, the bunch was split really significantly and some big names were caught in the, you know, in the, uh, the you know, either either caught in the crash or um, were delayed by it so you know riders were actually ruled out from that point on you know Geraint Thomas for example and not that I'm suggesting that he necessarily would have been a factor in the race at the sharp end but you know he was he eventually pulled out um, after that crash uh, Greg Van Avermaet then had a chase um, Oliver Narsen I think was was a, um, slowed down in that uh, crash as well and then later punctured Arno De Mar, who I think had he had a smooth first half of the race probably would have been able to be in that favourites group. Um, but you know the the effort of chasing um, it took its toll, I think, and so you know the the race was split up from a from quite an early point. And then Sagan went with 54 kilometres to go. Um, as you say, Daniel kind of slid off the front. And then when they came off that section of cobbles, um, Orshi, the Orshi section of cobbles. Um, and and then back onto the tarmac, uh, there was another significant crash. Um, the quick step rider, who I think on the, the commentary is suggested was Nicky Terpstra, a, a sort of flick of wheels, you know, as they were all sort of switching, um, and several people went down, including Alexander Kristoff, Tony Martin, Luke Rowe. Um, you know, that disrupted the organisation and momentum of that group um, and, and made it smaller and it meant that when it really shook down um, you were then left with really Terpstra, uh, Van Avermaet, Gilbert, Van Mark, Taylor Finney, I think Stein Vandenberg was in there for a while, um, Delia's teammate of course uh, so he wasn't going to be doing any chasing and I think the, the, the way um, the way the, the race panned out um, it all played into the favour of, of somebody making that kind of um, another ghostly move, really. Um, Sagan uh, from a, a lot further out than Nicky Turps during the Tour of Flanders, but a similar kind of um, exploiting the, the, the hesitation in, in the group. I mean, it's so easy again to say in hindsight, well, if Peter Sagan's going to go, I mean, he's in the rainbow jersey, he's not difficult to, not difficult to mark. But nobody sees that moment um, to to ride across, and you know, had the likes of you know Van Mark, Van Avermaet, and so on, um, you know, gone, then then you would have probably seen it. Well, you'd have seen a very different uh, denouement to the race. But and and, and well, what, what I thought it showed as well, Lionel, is that we've seen a classic season in which Quick Step have proven um, time and time again how comfortable they are on the offensive. Um, and, and forcing the other riders like Sagan onto the d defensive. And and what I thought Paris-Roubaix showed was that if the tables had been turned earlier in the classic season and, and, and uh, riders had tried to test them in that fashion, um, maybe they wouldn't, maybe they weren't as comfortable uh, when they were forced onto the back foot. Um, they certainly didn't look at yesterday. I mean, you have to... 
uh, you have to take into account it's been a long classic season and been very successful for them and maybe some of their riders are tired and, and maybe it felt yesterday felt like it was a bit of a bone it was going to be a bit of a bonus if they won yet another one but um, they didn't look great yesterday when they were, were put in a scenario where the only thing to do really was to get together and form a sort of co- cohesive chase well what was in, what's interesting is they, they were almost in the Peter Sagan role weren't they because suddenly it, it was quick step that everybody was talking about and looking at uh, and that's the role that Sagan has been in so much and which has counted against him in so many races when it's such a difficult thing for all that the bookies made Sagan the favourite quick set were the team that everybody was talking about and that's a very difficult position to be in well, especially when um, they make some fairly inexplicable grandstanding type moves, which which they did. Um, I mean, overconfidence. Yeah, I, I think, think. I mean, Philip, you possibly. I mean, Philippe Gilbert. I mean, a, a lot of people were talking about him as a potential winner. Um, you know, he's made a, a a big thing of of wanting to win all five monuments. He's he's still a fair way away from that, but you would think that. Um, you know, Paris Roubaix is the, the one that suits him the least, and and before Sunday he'd only ever ridden it once before. That was eleven years ago, and he finished fifty second, nearly ten minutes down. I was talking to um, a, a, a member of Pave Royalty on Saturday night, who's who, 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 who was who, that? Who was that? Who was who that? Suggested Lionel? that if Gilbert wanted to win, he'd better set off now. Was it A. Roger de Vlaminck, <laughs> B. Sean Kelly, or C. Dario Pieri? <laughs> well. <laughs> Say it again. I think we need to hear well, it again, he, Lionel, just so we can we can maybe use your you know the accent, the the, the voice that you're putting on there to guess. If if Gilbert was going to win, and bearing in mind we were talking on Saturday night, um, the, the the comment was he'd better set off now. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, but I think that that he and then Steve Bar showed it was overconfidence. It was it was far too ambitious what they what they were trying to do and. You know, it, it kind of bears out the point that, that Daniel was making, I think. just It's a strange old race though, Prairie Roubaix, isn't it? Because, you know, in what other race on the calendar now do we see a big hitter confident or, or think that they've got even a remote possibility of winning a race attacking from almost 100 kilometres from the line? Um, there, there, isn't, true. there isn't true. another race like that. And, um, you know, it's kind of fantastic that um, all of the, the sort of received knowledge and all the dogmas of how to race go out of the window of Paru Bay and it's completely different and it's it's the only race on the calendar where um, things that are important to the outcome of the race are happening throughout its duration um, it's it's not you know two moments or one moment where the race is decided that there are 30 or 40 moments over the course of the day when things that will ultimately matter um, in the overall picture are, are occurring and it's the only I mean the the you know the, the the trick in most bike races is to hit the front as late as possible and to do as little as possible on the front and Paris Bay is sort of the opposite of that isn't it where there's we saw with Dillier we saw it a couple of years ago with Matt Heyman as well it can be a real advantage to be out front you know and Dillier had a big day out he was he was riding in the wind an awful lot of the way but but it's a good place to be for for numerous reasons because people are coming up behind you but you've also got you've also got service and you've got support up there um Sagan needed that on the move as well didn't he on Sunday quite remarkable scenes with a, an Allen key adjusting his stem as as he rode along only only Peter Sagan could do that but you know Dillier is the latest example of somebody who's got out front early and been able to hold on and and again Pyro Bay is is one of if not the only races where that where that happens yeah, and I think, you know, Delia going in that break um, shouldn't overlook just what an impressive ride that was because he was in that move with, with several riders who were, you know, by no means, um, you know, certainly not weak in any sense. I mean, Yellow Wallace, uh, Mark Soler, I mean, Parry Nice winner. Um, not, you wouldn't have thought natural habitat on the cobbles, but, um, you know, clearly a class act. Uh, Jeffrey Soup. Of Kofidis, I think Smukulis was in there as well. You know, another another sort of diesel type rider, and so you know that was a that was a really strong looking move. And to be the to be the last man out of that move and to make it all the way to the finish, I mean that was, but you know, take nothing away from Peter Sagan's victory, but but Delier was without a doubt man of the match. Just read out a tweet from Larry Warbass. Uh, 
uh, Aqua Blue Rider early in the race when that break became established he tweeted expect this breakaway to go deep into the race um, with Smukulis, Smukulis Soler and Sylvain Dillier they could play an important part in the end very prescient there from uh, from Larry Warbass I once saw Smukulis on, on a dance floor and it was the, the, the memory um, has been well it's, it's, the image is burnt very much into my memory You've seen um, a lot of pressures like seen, this on dance he floors, was, Daniel. He was one of the more spectacular ones that I've seen. We, we obviously don't get invited to the right parties, Richard. Indeed. Shoot, uh, shoot at l'arrière du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. The voice of Seb Piquet there, and it reminds us to say a big thank you to this week's episode sponsor, Harry's. Yes, we welcome back, Harry's. Uh, Richard, are you still using your Harry's razor? I am, Lionel. Yes, the best razor I have used. Uh, so I'm still a satisfied customer, as you, the listener, can be. Uh, and you will be supporting the podcast as well if you go to harrys.com forward slash cycling to claim your trial set for just £3.95. The trial set includes a weighted razor handle in three different colours, a high-performance razor head made of five German-engineered steel blades, rich lathering foaming gel with natural ingredients like aloe and cucumber, and travel blade cover to protect your blades on the go. And all this is delivered to your door if you order the trial set. Harry's razors also come with a quality guarantee. If you don't love your products, then return them within 30 days for a full refund. Get started shaving with Harry's today by claiming your trial set for £3.95. It's actually worth £11.50. By going to harrys.com forward slash cycling right now. That's harrys.com forward slash cycling. What happened? It was just a very hard race. Full gas from the start because it was a tailwind, and uh, you always see when it's this straight, uh, this, this wind, strong or soft wind, but it's full gas racing because everybody can keep going, and so it's an honest race. Uh, I was always in control with the, with the team. We were always they kept me in, in a good position, and then Taylor did uh, the races of his life. I think now he lost uh, his best place from the last years, so he was really strong. The others also, and I didn't make a mistake. But in the end, I just got last 20 kilometer. I got suddenly really tired, and I felt still okay. But then uh, they started attacking in the final. And I felt suddenly I was uh, the weakest of uh, the five, so I knew it was going to be hard. Uh, or uh, four, yeah. I knew it was going to be hard, and I could only be on the on the podium if they gambled, and I could uh, I could get away, but it didn't happen. And yeah, I have to be happy with six because uh, yeah, I think in the end it was a maximum. So we heard a little bit of reaction there from Sepp van Mark. Uh, he was speaking to Hannah Troop in the in the velodrome in Roubaix as Peter Sagan was being presented on the podium. We heard that in the background there. Uh, another strong race from Sepp van Mark of education first, uh, but you know still quite a bit away from the win for him. His teammate Taylor Finney rode a good race as well and was eighth. Um, a lot of excitement in America about that because Finney has been promising big result for a long long time um but any other takeaways from the race chaps i mean the main the main one being of course sagan and and uh, we we have and lots of people have been accused of being kind of negative or critical of of sagan uh i don't i don't think that's the case i think there's a there's been a feeling for a long time that his his palmares does not reflect the rider that he is you know and and that he he could and should have won a lot more races He's won three world titles, which is extraordinary, and he's won lots and lots of other races. But these monuments were missing, and and you know he he won the Tour of Flanders a couple of years ago, but Milan San Remo and Paris Roubaix are the other two that are certainly within his grasp. Now he has a Paris Roubaix, and and it only needed that really, I think, to to really add quite a lot of sparkle to that Palmares. And and you know if if Sagan retired tomorrow, he would he would go down in history now is one of the, one of the all-time greats i think wouldn't he just just with that 
Yeah, I don't know. I think that's a bit premature, Rich. I mean, you know, he's got three world titles, same as Oscar Ferreira. Um, he's actually got fewer monuments than Oscar Ferreira because Oscar Ferreira won three Milan San Ramos. But um, I think he's, uh, you know, he's getting into his peak years now, isn't he? He's 28. Um, but the next three or four years are, are when he really needs to amass these these monuments. And he re- really, a guy of his talent should be should have won multiple tours of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix by the time he retires. But, um, you know, I'd sort of cast doubt on his uh, capacity to win a, a Paris-Roubaix. I was spectacularly wrong, not for the first time. Um, I think what I perhaps underestimated is the role that luck had or, or bad luck had played in his previous Paris-Roubaix. He mentioned this a number of times yesterday that he didn't have any punctures or any issues yesterday. And... Consequently, he came to the velodrome a lot less tired than he had been um, in previous years. Although, uh, he did also say that he was cramping yesterday before the sprint. So, I think in previous Paris Bays, he's really, really been struggling um, towards the back end of the race. But yesterday, he just looked he looked very relaxed on the cobbles. He had a nice sort of light touch. He wasn't sort of bouncing around and, and stressing. And, um, you know, he, he looked every inch the sort of mountain bike wizard or um, you know the kind of stuntman that we have that we've often portrayed him as you know someone who's very comfortable on his bike who's sort of absorbing the the vibrations of the road and and that obviously um, plays a massive role in fatigue in Paris-Roubaix I mean it's it's about kind of absorbing being able to absorb um, the, the, the sort of impact of the road and um, yeah I think yesterday he he did he proved me wrong and um, a lot of other people wrong. Well, I don't think he set out with that intention. To be fair, I mean, I think he was just trying <laughs> to prove to, Daniel wrong. Yeah, I think he was just trying to win the race. But uh, it's just, certainly on his mind, though. I don't want to get our, our member of uh, Pave royalty into trouble. But um, uh, he also mentioned on Saturday night that he thought Peter Sagan was carrying perhaps two or three kilograms more than than he might ideally do um and i wondered whether you know you talk uh, talk there about the the need to kind of absorb the punishment of the of the pave um and whether a little bit of extra weight might not um go amiss and um i wondered whether it's an it was, interesting theory. whether it was you know whether it was a part of the plan i mean he's already won the tour of flanders um you know paris bay is kind of next on the list and and perhaps you know there was some uh, perhaps there's something in that kind of home baked theory i i really don't know but um it it was uh you know he 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 didn't he didn't look comfortable in um the tour of flanders when put on the back foot uh, you know quick step really took the race on and put everyone under pressure and no one responded and everyone was looking at Sagan um, I think that the the terrain and the circumstances of the race you know the the time gaps um, to the lead group when uh, Sagan made his move was really encouraging wasn't it he, he didn't have to make a, a, a ridiculous effort to get across um, and there was still at that time a few numbers there as well so it wasn't like he was riding across to one rider so in terms of the way the race panned out uh, the opportunity was there at that uh, exact moment and, and he seized that opportunity and clearly looked very good on the cobbles and got that bit of help from Dillier on um, on the tarmac sections and it was kind of a it was a, a race win by numbers wasn't it I mean he, he plotted it extremely well I thought it's always very difficult to be on the back foot in a bike race though you know and i think we saw that with quick step on sunday um as we saw it with sagan the previous week on that question of sagan's place in the in the pantheon you know i i think that sometimes that status that a rider has owes to more than just the results on the palmares i mean i think of somebody like freddie martins for example who who never won a monument um and yet his record in other respects, quite similar to uh, to Peter Sagan's. And we we put Freddie Martins on a level above somebody like Oscar Freire, for example, or Eric Zabel, I think, um, because of the personality. And I think that's a, it's the same with Sagan. It's the personality. It's the, it's the way they can light up bike races. It's the unexpected things that they can do in bike races. Um, Freddie Martins was like that. I think Sagan is, is that sort of rider too, where on the one hand, it, his record is obviously brilliant but perhaps not as good as it could be but there's everything else that he brings to a race and brings to the sport in terms of personality and what he does and 
and the way that he animates races and the way that he does. Yeah, I think what introduces a note of caution to that, Rich, is what we feel is Sagan's potential. And as you say, that we, there is a general feeling that he hasn't necessarily fulfilled all of his potential yet. And they certainly got uh, a long way to go. Um, uh, that 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 would be my you know in, in the comparison with Freire, um I would say that with Freire it was kind of a, it was almost an, the opposite. Um, although he was someone who missed large portions of seasons through injury and so forth, mm. um, it it always seemed kind of miraculous that this guy with with you know not fantastic credentials, not for, he wasn't achieving great results throughout the whole season, but he would you know just appear on the on the biggest stage and he would pull out a result with Sagan we see him every week almost performing brilliantly but not necessarily converting translating um some of those great performances into victories realistically though I mean Milan San Remo he can clearly win he's been second twice and I think fourth a couple of times but he's not going to win Liège Baston Liège is he certainly not the type of rider he is at the moment and even in Lombardia I mean it's a monument but it's in a tricky part of the season um, you know you could you could perhaps imagine I mean he, he's always very good at the at the tail end of the season isn't he and certainly winning three world championships in a row um, you know there's not uh, it's not beyond the uh, realms of possibility that he could win Il Lombardia, but I think you know he's not he's not going to win Liège Baston Liège. I don't think as the, the the sort of size and type of rider that he is at the moment. No, we talked maybe if, if he goes on the Sean Kelly diet, maybe. <laughs> and we t- we talked uh, a few we talked a few weeks ago about this this idea of um, completing a palmarès. I think was it in relation to to Gilbert or mm. um, you know what what would it take uh, in order for for Gilbert to have the to have every sort of race that we thought he could, or Nibali, in fact, it was, wasn't it? And that we, we've sort of said that Nibali has pretty much won everything that he, he could win or that he would want to win, except maybe the World Championships. And um, with Sagan, I mean, what what is left? Um, there are those. Well, there's certainly Milan San Remo. Um, more of the same, so more Paris Bays, more Tours of Flanders, um, and, and he needs to go to the Giro at some point. I feel um, he always does the Tour of California. Um, he needs to get himself a leader's jersey in the, in the Giro, I would suggest. On the subject of criticism, we did get a bit of flack uh, for, from some quarters for not being absolutely bowled over by the Tour of Flanders last week and, and, and a bit lukewarm on Nicky Terpstra's victory. Um, we got a phone call actually from uh, a friend of ours, Charlotte Elton, who is a Belgian um, living in, in Brussels and uh, she offered a, 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 an alternative take on Nikki Terp. So here's what she said. Richard, I'm just listening to the um, to your podcast, and uh, you're talking about uh, about uh, Nikki Terpstra, and it's it's amazing, and I love all the apples apple analogies and whatever. But um, I, I don't know if um, if you know this, but uh, the in the first interview, which was in Flemish, he totally won over the Flemish. Uh, population because as he's still breathing super hard he started quoting a song like a Flemish song by Raymond van Trunewoud who is you know this older guy who like a very very famous Flemish um, singer also artist it's not like a schlager it's like a full-on it's a gorgeous song and it's called the Lief de Voor Music it's it's called the love for music but Terpstra actually changed the words to the love uh, for the course, you know, for the race. And like, it just blew us all away. And so people kept repeating it and it's like all over Facebook. And it was, you know, there was little snippets of him like saying these words. But I just thought that was the most, um, you know, the way they say in French, sympathique thing to do. And that made me really, really like him. And he's also incredibly smart. He's a very intelligent guy. The things he was saying, I think he sometimes gets like miss you know the dutch accent can sometimes confuse people but um his the way he speaks in in dutch is like he's incredibly intelligent and he's a cut above everybody everybody else but like you or like i don't know many people i just i was annoyed that he won but he definitely won the um the best kind of post interview uh ever and he's now i'm now a huge fan anyway i thought i'd just let you know that um and that everyone really appreciated that here in Flanders so um, anyway I'm just gonna keep listening bye 
so thank you for that, Charlotte. That was interesting uh, bit of feedback. This might become a semi-regular feature, actually, if we have a number that people can leave messages on and we can play them in the podcast. This is an idea that we're working on. Do stay tuned for, for more information about that. But, yeah, I mean, Charlotte made a, a, a very interesting point. It was made by a few others as well that perhaps uh, people enjoyed the Tour of Flanders to a greater extent than we appeared to. I, I must say I found the race absorbing. Um, but were you, both of you uh, more absorbed by Sunday's Pyro Bay than by Flanders the previous week? Did it live up to expectations a bit more? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I felt there was a lot more going on. As Daniel made the point um, a little earlier, that, that the things that were happening were all relevant in some way. Um, to, to You don't feel like... You know, when there was that big split after Troisville, you knew that that was a significant moment, and you know, then you're sort of scrambling to work out who's in the, who's in the first bit, who's in the second bit, who's in the third bit, and and sort of seeing how the, how the the whole pieces of the jigsaw come back together again, and and um, you know what impact those events might have on it. Whereas the Tour of Flanders was a bit more, um, as I said last week, it was. Um, it was all building towards that one attack and that one attack happened and, and then that was it. And there was, you know, I, I felt that you know, Roubaix lends itself um, to being a, a race that does stand watching from start to finish because you just never know the bits that might be significant. You, you could see something in the first hour that turns out to um, really shape the race as, as we did. That break going clear and it didn't go clear in the first hour really, did it? It went clear a, a, a fair bit after that. It was a, a long time coming. Um, that move and so you, you you couldn't take your eyes off it in in um, which you, I don't really feel I could say about the Tour of Flanders but you know next year it may well be that the Tour of Flanders is the the five star race and, and Paris Roubaix is a three star race you, you just don't know uh, I would agree with that Lionel in this age or this recently dawned age where it's suddenly become fashionable to broadcast the whole of um, bike races um, I would say Paris Bay is the only one that really presents compelling arguments for that to be the case, apart from the the hundred kilometer or I think this year there's a sixty kilometer stage in the Tour de France, isn't there? Um, but yeah, the, there is stuff happening um, throughout the day that is interesting, that's important. Um, so uh, you know, I don't think it was the greatest Paris Bay in history, but uh, it was. It was. I'm not going to give it a wine glass um, rating because I, I want to keep those for the for the Grand Tours, but um, I thought it was a, a solid 6 out of 10. Cool. Se- se- seven, 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 six is too low. We'll get, we'll, get more, we'll, get, we'll get more phone calls. No, seven, at least, at least a seven, more than seven. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science in Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. A reminder that you can get 25% off with the code SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. We have been asking for a few weeks for questions from you for their nutritionists. I went last week to meet with Dr. Rob Child, their Chief Scientific Officer at the Offices of Science and Sport, and put a lot of your questions to him. We'll play them one by one over the coming weeks. Um, We'll hear the first one in a moment. We should also say that um, if you've got questions for riders um, the science of sport are involved with a few riders including mark cavendish and um, we will try and put some of your questions to them perhaps about the pros nutrition and um, keep them about nutrition please that would be great um but yeah send us in your questions contact at the cycling podcast.com rob charles work, works with quite a number of top riders used to work with team katusha still works i believe with steve cummings and several others and um, here he is answering the first of our questions question this week rob from michael edwards in beaconsfield michael asks i have a question for the experts from science and sport i'm doing liege bastille and liege in a few weeks it's a long day in the saddle and you need to eat a lot the feed stations at these types of events mainly have sugar-based snacks and bananas I love the Science of Sport products, and they are also the same. After a few hours, all the sugar can feel tough on the stomach. Bearing in mind I don't want to stop for a croque monsieur, what advice would our friends from Science of Sport have on what to carry and eat to help balance the high gel bar drink load of a long day in the saddle? That's a great question, and uh, the pros actually provide quite a, a good answer for that one. So... It's important to consume some savoury foods as well when you're doing those ultra long rides. And uh, some great things uh, to use would be rice cakes made with, for example, bacon or Parmesan cheese. 
Uh, and a simple alternative, if you aren't as adventurous in the kitchen, would be something like a peanut butter sandwich where it's made with uh, white bread, so it's easy to digest, but with with the peanut butter in there to provide some fats to fuel the ride and a little bit of protein as well. So that was Rob Child, the Chief Scientific Officer at Science and Sport, and we'll hear more of his responses to your questions, some really fascinating ones over the next few weeks and months. Um, so, fellas, we're going to sort of review the Cobbled Classics season. That, that's it over for another year. We move into the the Ardennes now um, via Amstel Gold Race, which is not in the Ardennes, of course. Uh, but the uh, what, what's your assessment? And what Daniel, you were suggesting earlier that we might come up with some hits and misses as we review the, the Cobbled Classics. What are you, what's on your list of the... Well, I should get the, the negatives out of the way first. Yeah, do that. In time-honoured fashion. Um... Well, I think, you know, just looking at the teams, there were a couple of teams that really struggled. Um, I think Sunweb were always likely to have a less successful season um, than they did last year, our team of ye- the year last year, of course. Um, I'm sure there are there are brighter times, happier times to come for them later in the season when the stage races really um, get going. But they did not have a particularly great spring. I think Soren Craig Anderson, one of their big hopes, had back problems and that... That hampered them, and Michael Matthews had had some issues as well, and he didn't really flourish in the way that he wanted to. Um, but uh, they were one of several teams that, that struggled. I thought Dimension Data are really struggling at the moment with Cavendish out, and um, difficult to see where their wins are going to come from at the moment, and they were certainly not much of a factor. Edvard Boastenhagen didn't have a great winter with um, um, health issues, and um, rode pretty well for 200 kilometers in Paris Bay but sort of faded in the finale um and Katuja had a bit of a well they was a bit of an overhaul in the winter didn't they and um they came into the classics without Christoph of course he he had left and um Tony Martin was was going to be the captain this year and did not really pull up any trees did he Tony Martin um 72nd in Paris Bay having finished 63rd in the Tour of Flanders and um, was pretty prominent as I suggested last week he would be at various points of the race but again was not really in the thick of the action when it mattered. Um, a slightly brighter note for them, Niels Pollitt uh, performed pretty encouragingly, 17th in Flanders, 7th in Roubaix. Um, so yeah, they were they were some of the sort of low lights. Alexander Kristoff, I thought, had a disappointing classics season, um, 57th in Paris-Roubaix, 17th in Flanders, although had ridden fairly well in Milan San Remo, he was 4th there. But yeah, they were they were a few of mine. And another one, a bit of an outlier, I thought Denex Stebart didn't have as great a spring as, well, obviously, some of his quick step colleagues. A few noises coming out of there, actually, that quick step might not be that thrilled with um, Stebart at the moment. Um, he didn't really listen to instructions yesterday at Paru Bay, I'm told. That was certainly not part of the plan that he would attack when he did. And um, yeah, they're not they're not too enthused by some of what they've seen from him this spring. Team Sky as well. I mean, you know, they uh, with SumWeb and uh, and Dimension Data, they are perhaps don't have anything like the resources that, that Team Sky have. And looking at those two teams, one win each uh, so far this year. But Team Sky's cobbled classics campaign pretty appalling. Not not a single top ten. Um, 12th at Flanders for Dylan Van Baal and 19th at Roubaix for Dylan Van Baal. Um, really, really pretty poor. Um, Luke Rowe had another bad day, didn't he, with a with a bad crash? But uh, they would expect a lot more, given that on paper at least they've got you know pretty strong team. Stannard, Moscon, Van Baal, Thomas, Luke Rowe. That was a strong team they put out for for Roubaix, and 19th was their best rider there. Well, if we're focusing on people who underperformed in the Cobble Classics, I mean, we have to mention Greg Van Avermaet. I mean, last year he was on fire, wasn't he? Um, could could hardly stop him winning. This year, a third place at uh, Grand Prix E3 Harrowbecker, about as good as it got. Always there, always looking a little bit underpowered. Yeah, I, I that I'd agree with that, Lionel. Certainly, his form doesn't look anything like last year. But I have to take my hat off to Van Avermaet for his sort of his fighting spirit you can see that he's under pride you can see that he's not got the form he's got last year but you know he was one of the as da- as daniel i think mentioned earlier he was one of the guys who was attacking just before sagan got away and he's despite perhaps not having the legs 
he's still he's still giving it a good go, hasn't he? Um, uh, maybe I mentioned as well for my tip for Pirate Bay, Daniel Oss, who uh, has been on the winning team now two years in a row with uh, BMC last year and played an absolutely vital role in Van Avermaet's win last year. And then a, a very strong ally for Peter Sagan uh, in Pirate Bay this year as well. Should we move on to the, the positives? Yeah, on the upside. Go on, Daniel. Um, uh, a bit of a left field choice because some might think he was disappointing, but I think Jasper Stuyven did well. Um, he was fifth in Prairie Bay, seventh in Flanders, tenth in Dwarves Door of Londres, ninth in Ghent Vevelgum, sixth in E3. So very, very consistent. Now he doesn't he doesn't take too many risks, but um, I kind of think the way he rode. Well, it reminds me of when a rider is struggling in the in the Tour de France or a Grand Tour, and you know. There's always a debate, should they just go for stage victories now? Should they just launch kamikaze attacks? I always think that they learn more by sort of toughing it out and, and seeing how far they can go on the general classification, even if things aren't going too well. And I think Stuyven's spring was much like that, really. Um, rather than you know throw the kitchen sink at it and, and hope something stuck, he, he just, you know, I think he gained experience of being in an... It, in amongst the, the best riders and and I think that he'll probably be even stronger next year and will be a, a real contender um, so I thought he he did okay um, the the stage race riders that came to the Cobble Classics um, and well impressed us all so that was um, Alejandro Valverde in Duas d'Or of Londres and Vincenzo Nibli in the Tour of Flanders and Marc Soler yesterday in, in Paris Bay. I don't think anyone expected Marc Soler to go as far as he did in, in that break or lead the race into the Arenberg Forest. So um, that was a positive for me. And just finally, the spirit of Paris Bay. So yesterday there was uh, a Lithuanian rider, I think he is, Evaldas Siskeviskius. Uh, who got to the velodrome an hour late, an hour after, um, or no, not really late, um, an, an hour after um, Sagan had crossed the line, and it was closed. The, the gate was locked. And, and all um, the sandwiches uh, are gone. Well, uh, the, the sandwiches are gone, but that, to me, that's an ideal scenario, to get to a velodrome when the gates are locked and you get turned and you have to... You have to go home and do something else. But no, um, he he waited for, and um, presumably it was someone from the, from the organisation to open the gate again, and he got back in and he finished Paris Bay. And yeah, you know, there were there were various stories like that yesterday, as there always are every year at Paris Bay. And I think it's um, as we said earlier, it's it's a race apart. It's a race in which um, a lot of the sort of dogmas of professional cycling go out of the window. You have got these star riders or these um, you know these highly prepared highly trained uh, very professional athletes um to have a different more sort of dilettante attitude and they all just want to finish Paru bay they don't care whether they're inside the time limit or outside um it's just a, a badge of honor that they can wear for the rest of their lives and i think it's it's great that that survives and we get stories like that one yesterday well i mean the obvious one uh the quick step team it, between the 27th of february and uh, the 4th of april they had eight one day wins not all uh, well uh, skelder price not uh, not a cobbled race um but still part of the same season of races isn't it but nikki terpstra kicked it off with le samin remy cavagna won the Dwarves d'Or west flanderlin fabio jacobson won nokia de corsa ali hodge of Scotland won the Hansama Classic, uh, Terpstra won E3, Lampert won the Dwarves of Flanders, and Terpstra again won the Tour of Flanders, um, Fabio Jakobsen won Skelder Price. I mean, that is dominance uh, of a different level. And I mean, if you if you um, believe all the hype about the Quickstep Lotto Sudal um, rivalry, I mean, you know, that's a sort of an, an eight nil hammering. Um, in quick steps favour isn't it over the course of the races that mean the most to Patrick Lefevre and co yep absolutely um, I mean I, I'd, I'd highlight Vincenzo Nibali as well it's not a cobbled classic but Milan San Remo um, let's, let's include that in the discussion as well um, you know you talk about we're talking about Sagan and what Pyro Bay does to his Palmares and, and, and will do for his legacy. And you could say the same about Nibali and Milan San Remo really just elevates him. And then to come to Tour Fans Road, as he did there, uh, hugely impressive. Um, Lotta Sudal, yeah, not not a great spring for them, but Tesh Banut has certainly started to, I think, fulfil the the potential that he that he showed back in was it twenty fifteen he was up there in Tour of Flanders. Um he's still only twenty four, but a collection of, of results, fifth at E three, seventh at Dwarsdor Vlandren, 
uh, eighth at Tour of Flanders, those positions don't necessarily reflect, you know, how much of an impact he had on the, on those races and and how active he was in them. His his challenge is going to be winning races, but um, it was good to see him being so active and and strong in those in those races. And and he's got a bit more to his uh, his game than than some of the others as well. I think we'll see him. Um, Maybe Amstel Gold race, and you know he can he can do a bit more than just ride the Cobble Classics. So it looks good for him. Um, any other positives for just, you, chaps? Well, just a, a final couple of footnotes, Rich, and um, from yesterday, um, Tongi Turgis, nineteen years old, oh, yeah. um, the youngest rider to finish Paris Bay since Roger Gesslink in nineteen thirty nine. Um, he was he was forty second actually riding for the new. Uh, Vital concept team, so that was worthy of a mention. I thought, and and Taylor Finney as well. Um, we well, it's pretty well well documented how awful the injury he sustained in the 2014 U.S. Pro Championships was um, a compound fracture of his leg, and it's been a long old road back. I think there have been several moments along the way when he's doubted uh, whether he has a future as a professional cyclist. And um, rode a brilliant race yesterday, and um, yeah, a, a story of of perseverance and persistence, and um, a, a happy ending. I'm sure it's not the last word in in the story of of Taylor Finney's career, but um, yeah, all looking good for him. It is it, because I think the question about Taylor Finney has also been how much does he want it? You know, he was on BMC for many years, and I, I think he was at a bit of a crossroads after that. You know, whether whether to even continue as a, as a pro and. Um, that performance at Pirate Bay, that's the race that's, that most suits him. What that might do for him in terms of, you know, planning ambitions and targets in future years. Well, and know. I think that that team has also turned a corner, Rich. I mean, uh, when you speak to people within the EF education team, they feel that with the new uh, sponsor and, in fact, new owner, um, mm. coming on board that things have, have changed this year and, and I think they took a huge amount of confidence from Rigoberto Aran's Tour de France last year and they start, they're start they starting to feel uh, more like winners and that's kind of percolating through into all sort of areas of that team um, you know, be it the stage races, the one day races the staff or, and so forth and so forth so um, yeah it'll be interesting to see how they fare in the next few weeks when we get to the Giro and then the Tour de France Indeed, indeed. Um, just briefly on the, the tour of the Basque Country before we finish, because uh, our focus this week has been on, on Pirate Bay, really. But that was a hugely impressive uh, performance by Primoz Roglic. Um, and people start, you know, you want to stage at the Tour de France last year, still very much a developing talent, although he's not, not young. Is he 29 now, Roglic? Um, but he is, you know, we could be we could be looking at a fairly open Tour de France, couldn't we? And he might well go into that race as as a, as a real strong outsider. Do you not think? Punchy, very punchy. I'm going to tell you what his odds are now. I'm just looking up his odds, Rich. Napalm, odds. what do you reckon? Well, I mean, I think the the, the thing is, he's, he's got um, a lot of the things that he would need in the locker for a sort of top 10, maybe even top five. Um, you know, it first came to prominence at the Giro a couple of years ago, uh, winning the time trial there in, in pretty sketchy conditions. And then won the stage in the Alps last year, Rich, when you were in the um, Cannondale team car. It was that day, wasn't it? I can't it remember. Was. To it Ser was. To Ser Chevalier, was that? That's correct. Um, you know, a difficult day and an impressive win. Obviously, um, not... Uh, you know, he wasn't hampered by the fact that anyone was marking him for the for the overall. Um, so, but he, you know, he's he's proven himself now in these week long stage races. Um, you know, the the results are getting better all the time, and to um, to win the Tour of the Basque Country is is definitely not to be sniffed at. Because I mean, whenever you look at it, they seem to be going uphill, and then when they're not going uphill, it's raining, and not, sometimes it's it's raining when they're going uphill. It's a tough race. Well, I, I, sh mm -hmm. I should add, he's actually 28, and and on the penultimate stage of the race, he did have a lot of uh, teammates finish that stage. Uh, just to add to the point, the jovial point we made at the start about his team sport, he finished the last stage without any any teammates left, but uh, the work had been done by then. Well, Rich, um, you can have a bet on the the Tour de France, the winner of the Tour de France, without Chris Froome, and at William Hill. 
Mm. Um, Primoz Roglic is 66 to 1. Um, if we assume that Chris Froome, which is a big assumption that Chris Froome is not going to ride the Tour de France, Primoz Roglic 66 to 1. Good Favourite is Richie Port at 2 to 1. 3 wow. to 1, Naira well, Quintana. Naira well. Quintana did, wasn't that impressive in the Basque Country, was he? And, and Richie Port um, seems to be struggling to, to, to recapture the form that he had last year before the Tour. Mark Cavendish is 2,000 to 1 to win the Tour de France without Chris Froome. Oh, it's definitely that worth a, a punt, no? That's a great bet. I'm going to stick 50 quid on that and then, <laughs> and then retire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Richie Port has really looked off colour. I don't know if something up with him, but you know, even the time trial in the Basque Country, he wasn't, he wasn't competitive. So, uh, no, something up with Richie Port. But... Um, don't put your money on him, I don't think, at the moment for the Tour de France. Anyway, that's all a long way away. Shall we Shall we leave it there, chaps? Yes. Okay, well, until next week. Daniel, thank you. Thank you. Lionel, thank you. Well, I'll not be here next week. I'll be in Belgium on a secret mission, eh? Oh, but you're not going to join us for the podcast? Um, well, it depends when you're recording, doesn't it? I mean, I might be unavailable. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Uh, well, we might see you next week, might not. Thanks for now. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. You have been listening to The Cycling Podcast. Subscribe to our newsletter at thecyclingpodcast.com to get all the latest news and special offers delivered straight to your inbox. This episode was edited and produced by Tom Wally. 